Hi, everyone, and welcome to the primary source webinar on teaching the history of the LGBT movement from the 1950s to the present. My name is Josh Craycraft. I'm one of the program directors at Primary Source, and I'll be facilitating this evening's discussion. Before we begin, I'd like to take, uh, talk just a little bit about uh, the format for today's discussion and how you can participate. First of all, if you haven't done so already, uh, please be sure to run the audio setup wizard, which you can find in the upper left corner of your screen. It's the little icon of the microphone and the red starburst. Uh, in just a few minutes, I'll be introducing our keynote speaker for the evening, Professor Daniel Hurwitz, uh, who we're very fortunate to have with us tonight. He'll be giving a talk uh, that'll last about 45, 50 minutes or so, after which we'll have some time for Q&A. To participate and ask questions, simply type your questions into the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. Please keep in mind that this chat box is public and that even if you're having a private conversation with another participant, Professor Horowitz and I will still be able to see what you type. Uh, as moderator, I'll be selecting questions for discussion uh, that you type into the chat box. Um, I do suspect that we will have lots of questions, um, but I'm also hoping that we'll be able to get to everyone's question, uh, even if we discuss them out of order. Unless you have a really burning question that needs answering right away uh, for the sake of clarity, um, I ask you uh, to please hold your questions until the Q&A portion at the end so that Professor Hurwitz has time to get through his entire talk before we wrap up today. One other thing I want to do um, before we move on is to quickly explain who we at Primary Source are, uh, since I know that some of you may be encountering us for the first time today. If so, welcome. Uh, great to meet you and have you. Um, and for those of us, uh, for those of you who we worked with before, welcome back. Um, I do see lots of familiar faces. Uh, as you can see on our little info slide here, we are a 27-year-old nonprofit organization started by teachers for teachers with a specific goal of bringing the wider world and all of its color and complexity to students. We do this by creating professional development programs for K-12 educators that are focused on U.S. and global content and themes. We run both face-to-face -face and online programs, for example, uh, including grad-level courses, international study tours, and online seminars uh, just like this one. We also produce multimedia resource guides and curricula about U.S. and global topics, um, one of which we'll be talking about later on in this session. Information about all of our resources and programs and opportunities is accessible through our website at primarysource.org, and I encourage you to check them out. Um, let's get on to the stuff that really matters, the LGBT movement and how we teach about it. Professor Hurwitz has provided a brief outline for his talk today. As you can see, we'll basically be discussing the movement through time, from the homophile movement of the 1950s and 1960s, um, to some of the new gains that have been won in LGBT rights in the 2000s. Toward the end of our session tonight, we'll also be highlighting some resources to help you learn more uh, beyond what we discuss here today. As I mentioned a number of times already, uh, we have speaking with us today Professor Daniel Hurwitz, an individual to whom I'm delighted to introduce you. Dr. Hurwitz holds a PhD in history, uh, which he completed at UCLA, and he's currently teaching at Hunter College at the City University of New York. He teaches the second half of the U.S. History Survey, as well as courses on the history of gender and sexuality, post-war America, and LGBT American history. He's the author of two books, Bohemian Los Angeles and the Making of Modern Politics, published in 2007 by the University of California Press. And before that, Stepping Out, Nine Walks Through New York City's Gay and Lesbian Past, which was published by Holt in 1997. Of late, he's actually working on writing LGBT history for the theater, um, and he's currently working on two plays, one about Bayard Rustin and another about homophobic policing in the 1930s. He's clearly a man of many talents, and we're so pleased that he was willing to work with us uh, in bringing this online seminar to you. Professor Hurwitz, thanks so much for joining us, and please feel free to begin when you're ready. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, that's a sweet introduction, and um, I just wanted to say how thrilled I was to be invited by Primary Source to talk with you all this afternoon or this evening, I guess, depending where you are in the country. Um, and I also wanted to say how moved I am to see so many of you signing in to join into this uh, conversation. I think it's clear um, in this moment when so many people that I know are asking, what can we do to deal with what's happening in the world around us? Um, it's clear that teachers like you are already doing so much to shape and change our society. And I'm 
thrilled to get to be with you today. Um, before diving into that history of the LGBT movement, I, I do really want to stress that, uh, that first point, which is um, that when it comes to um, LGBT inclusion or LGBT discrimination, it's clear that the work of teachers who include LGBT content in their classrooms makes a significant impact on the students that they work with, whether those students are queer or not. And I just wanted to draw your attention, for instance, to some research done by an organization called GLSEN that works with um, gay and lesbian students around the country um, from a survey they did, uh, this they did in 2009, that would be after eight years of George W. Bush's presidency, um, where they talked to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender students about their experiences in their schools. And I just wanted to underscore two things that they mentioned. One was that they found that an inclusive curriculum, that is a curriculum that included positive representations of LGBT folks, helped to create a climate of respect in their schools. So for instance, among their findings, if you can see this tiny fine print, students in schools with an inclusive curriculum found that homophobic language and homophobic attitudes declined. At the same time, Glisten found that schools that had educators like you all being visible supporters of LGBT individuals made LGBT students feel safer in those schools. And again, if you look at the fine print, actually do better. Uh, I'm struck by the last line in the box here which said that students uh, in schools with supportive staff actually had higher GPAs. So I just wanted to frame my talk today by underscoring that I'm I firmly believe that your efforts in this arena, whatever they are, at whatever level you go for, will make a significant difference for the students that you work with. Having said that, then, I want to turn to walking with you today through a kind of overview of the LGBT rights movement as it has unfolded over the last 70 or 65 years, I guess, in the history of the country. Um, and I want to start us off um, going back to the birth of that movement in the 1950s. LGBT activism in this country really started in 1950. Um, a handful of organizations in that decade identified themselves as part of a homophile movement. They were the first gay rights activists that this country had really seen who, had, who succeeded in starting organizations that had a long-lasting effect. I'll turn in a minute to looking at the impact of homophile activism, but just to set, it, set their story up for you, I just want to talk about the various factors that triggered the start of this movement, the start of the gay rights movement in this country, and try to highlight three elements that, from the preceding decades, from the 1930s and 40s, demonstrated to gay men and women around the country that they were living in an increasingly homophobic culture a culture that was newly homophobic in ways that it had not been in previous decades. And so the three elements that demonstrate this, and I think really led to the birth of the gay rights movement in this country, surprisingly, start first of all with the repeal of prohibition, which I'm sure you're familiar with in the 1930s. When prohibition was repealed and states began licensing bar owners in the establishments of bars um, in cities around the country, they did so, many states, with, for the first time, explicit language that forbade bar owners to allow homosexual activity or presence in those bars. To allow homosexuals to gather in your bar meant that as a bar owner you would lose your license. This, as you can imagine, led to the creation of separate gay and lesbian bars in the 1930s. If we only go back to the 1920s to the era of speakeasies, we know that gay and lesbian socializing was very much integrated with that of mainstream culture. But now gay and lesbian socializing was marked as illegal in the 1930s, and gay and lesbian bars were marked as illegal, which also meant that the only folks who were willing to own and run those bars with people who are willing to be criminals, typically the mafia. So in the 1930s, we began to see the social isolation of gay and lesbian folks. That isolation deepened in the 1940s 
in the context of World War II when the military, the American military, established policies banning, again for the first time, gay and lesbian service people. In the context of World War II, the military first of all tried to screen gay men and women out of service as they were recruiting and drafting young men and women across the country. When they found that that screening process did not successfully keep gay men and women out of the service, the military then began an aggressive program of prosecuting those men and women um, found to be gay in the military, uh, a, a program of court-martialing and discharging those service people. To be clear, something like 10 million Americans served in the military, young Americans served in the military in the context of World War II. That means 10 million Americans experienced or witnessed this screening and this prosecution. All or most of them were asked about their sexual desires for the first time, raising a question in their head, what kind of sexual desires might they be having? And then they witnessed or experienced this aggressive treatment on behalf of the military which is to say that this was deeply woven into the national wartime experience. If you're interested at all in teaching about um, the experience of gay men and women during World War II, let me flag for you a terrific documentary called Coming Out Under Fire, um, which I've used in classrooms quite successfully, and I really recommend it. So prohibition created social isolation. This was deepened in World War II by the military. And then the third trigger that I would flag was the start of the Cold War, what we typically, I think, in our classrooms often refer to as the McCarthy era, where this kind of isolation and discrimination only expanded further. Typically, I think we talk about the McCarthy era, era as specifically anti-communist in its focus, and certainly that was a true focus. But in the context of concerns about the loyalty of civil servants and the security of the United States, the federal government also began to target gay um, men and women as members of the civil service. And indeed, they sought out those people and had them driven out of the federal government. In truth, the number of Americans who were fired from the civil service for some kind of LGBT accusation far exceeded the number of Americans fired because of questions about communism. That's led historians to refer to the late 1940s and early 1950s as a period of what we call the Lavender Scare. And to be clear, the Lavender Scare, although it began with the federal government, trickled down in ways that probably we can readily imagine um, to state governments, city governments, and many companies when companies, for instance, which did business with the federal government saw the kind of security um, questions that the federal government established, they mimicked those questions and those screening for their own employees as well. So by the start of the 1950s, we saw the establishment now of a widespread homophobic culture in this country. It's in that context, then, of this movement from social isolation to military discrimination to then widespread homophobic treatment that we finally see the birth of a gay rights movement in this country as a resistance to that homophobic culture. It's in that context the homophile movement began. And the homophile movement began in Los Angeles at the end of 1950 with the start of an organization called the Madison Society, a tiny organization a handful of men and a couple of women launched the Madison Society in late 1950 in L.A. It was really, the organization was really the brainchild of this man, Harry Hay, um, who was an interesting, dynamic character. Um, Hay had been prior to this an actor in L.A. Um, in the 1930s. Um, and in fact, in the 1930s, he'd done a local production of Waiting for Lefty by Clifford Adetz, where he became, well, first friends and then lovers with another actor named Will Gear. If any of you online are as old as I am, you might remember Will Gear as much later in his life performing the role of Grandpa Walton. <laughs> but if you don't remember that, that's okay. Um, more significant in Hayes' life, Gear was also very active in the Communist Party. And he really pulled Hay as an actor into the party. And ultimately, the Communist Party provided a framework for Harry Hay for thinking about this growing oppression of gay people. 
if you're interested in Harry Hay and the start of the Madison Society, I would I would flag for you another documentary called Hope Along the Wind. And let me just say at the end of the talk, I'll stick up a slide which has a bunch of these documentaries listed, so you don't have to be scribbling them down if that's a concern. Um, but as Hay began Madison with this small group gathered together, they began to articulate three key um, ideas as they launched launched their organization, which ultimately launched the gay rights movement. First of all, they said that their inner emotional lives mattered and were significant. Their sexual desires, their romantic feelings were fundamentally important to who they were as people. It wasn't something um, on the periphery of who they were. It was central to who they were. At the same time, they said these desires, these fantasies, um, these hopes and dreams mark us now in American society for oppression. And that oppression really makes us a distinct social group within American society. Or, using a term that was coming into more frequent use at the time, marks us as a minority group. Interestingly, I think across the 30s and 40s, the Communist Party had been one of the leading groups fighting against racism in this country. And in many ways, Hay and Madison borrowed their framework for thinking about the treatment of racial groups um, and racism to explain the position of homosexual men and women in American society as well, ultimately arguing that um, gay men and women constituted an equivalent oppressed social group. Now, to us, um, at the start of the 21st century, that's probably not um, very surprising argument to make, but I just want to stress that in the 1950s, these were challenging ideas. Many homosexually active men and women would have argued back to Harry, hey, hey, who I have sex with is not essential to who I am as a person, and I'm definitely not a part of a minority group. Certainly, they would have said no more maybe than alcoholics constitute a minority group or people who like the dark meat of chicken constitute a minority group they really would have resisted this formulation, and they did resist this formulation that Hay um, and others put together. So much of the early work that Madison did was fundamentally organizing discussion groups, typically organized in secret in people's homes across California where people gathered slowly by the dozens and then by the hundreds, where in their discussions what they fundamentally created was a shared self-conception a shared sense of, oh, you are like me, we are all similar. So many people who attended Madison meetings in those early um, years talked about walking into a meeting and having this incredible feeling of, oh my God, I'm not the only one. I wanted to share with you the pledge that Madison members were asked to sign on to when they joined the organization. This is a primary document that I think is terrifically teachable. I've used it many times in the classroom. Um, the Madison pledge, as much as Madison marked um, the beginning of the gay rights movement, when students look at this pledge, and maybe you'll have this reaction, they're often disappointed by the language that Madison had in 1950, 51, 52. So for instance, Madison said, while it is my conviction that homosexuality in our society is not a virtue, but rather a handicap, which is to say these were not people celebrating with pride their homosexuality. Um, nonetheless, Nadishin saw itself in this way uh, I've mentioned as linked to other minority groups, and so they called on Nadishin members to essentially to live in coalition with other racial, religious, and national minorities. As goals, Madison said, that Madison members here at number three should try to observe the generally accepted social rules in terms of conduct, attire, and speech, which is to say, try to fit in. Don't be too flamboyant. Certainly, don't um, be gender inappropriate. Try to fit in with mainstream American life. And in addition, Madison operated with anonymity. And so all members were asked here at number six to guard the anonymity of all members. So this is the beginning of the gay rights movement. It was largely a consciousness-raising beginning, but one that operated in secret and kept an inward focus. Madison, which started in 1950, was joined in 1955 by a new group called the Daughters of Belitis. 
which began in San Francisco in 55 and identified women, lesbians, as their organizing focus. That issue hadn't ever excluded lesbians, but many lesbians felt like Mattachine was much more focused on men than on something more inclusive. Uh, DOB, Daughters of Belitis, was started by this couple, Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon. If you had all followed the story of gay marriage uh, as it unfolded in California, you would know that um, the two of them were the first couple invited to San Francisco to, to be married as a same-sex couple when San Francisco began doing that. The DOB had very similar ideas as Mattachine. You'll see here in their statement of purpose, for instance, that they echo the language of training or educating the variant, that was their term, mm -hmm. um, to live in a, with a mode of behavior and address that's acceptable to society, right, a similar ethos of fitting in. They identified in terms of an agenda that part of their goal was to educate the public to be more accepting but that they also encouraged gay women to be willing to be um, available to researchers, essentially to turn themselves over to science so that scientists, experts, could prove to the rest of America that yes, gay men and women were normal. Madison, Daughters of Belitis, and a couple of other homophile groups spread very slowly around the country in the 1950s and into the 60s. Madison, had chapters, for instance, in LA, in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Washington, DC, and the same was true of Daughters of Belitis. Let me just remind you that these are in the years that the black civil rights movement is really expanding around the country as well. So 54, 55, we see the Montgomery bus boycott. By 1960, we see a sit-in movement expand, uh, take place and, and roll out across the country. And 1963, of course, was um, the March on Washington with Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Those developments influenced homophile activists. And in the mid-1960s, these secretive, inwardly turned uh, set of organizations began to turn outward and to demand rights for themselves. And that turning outward, that becoming outspoken, marked the emergence of a second wave of gay activism in this country that was referred to at the time and still as gay liberation. This was something that didn't happen overnight. It unfolded slowly, but it began, and it began inside of homophile groups. So for instance, this was the first ever protest. This is uh, 1965 in front of the White House. The Madison chapter there organized a march out in front of the White House on behalf of homosexual men and women. Um, the DC Madison was led by this fellow who's hidden behind his sign stick, Frank Kameny, um, who was an astronomer who'd been fired by the federal government for being gay in those purges in the early 50s and had become an organizer. That same year, again, in a first ever move, Barbara Giddings, who was the head of the Daughters of Belitis in New York, worked with others to organize an annual protest in, Philadelphia, in front of Philadelphia's Independence Hall. While in both of these moments we could see the broad kind of declarations of demands for civil rights emerging on behalf of gay men and women, Increasingly, these activists, as they, be, as they started to go more public, began to focus on social segregation and the access to public social space. So, for instance, the following year, in 1966, in New York City, a group of Madison men went on kind of a bar crawl, challenging the law that excluded bartenders from serving clearly homosexual patrons. They did so trying to generate press attention, and they did get the New York Times to write up their actions. I'm struck always by this headline from the Times, Three Deviates Invite Exclusion by Bars, so you know this is not the most sympathetic of press coverage. But nonetheless, the coverage brought attention to the fact that gay men and women were excluded from socializing and drove, at least in New York, the state legislature to begin to change this policy. I also just want to draw your attention to the attire these Madison activists are wearing, right? The suit jackets, the ties. These are men who are fitting in for sure. Among them, the young man in the center was Craig Rodwell, 
who became an early key figure in gay liberation, certainly in New York, but also an important figure in the country as a whole. Not so much for his participation here, but because he opened up the country's first LGBT bookshop um, in downtown New York in, in the village. And having a gay bookshop was a similar kind of claiming of public space, right? A similar kind of saying, we have a right to be here. But ultimately, in these late 1960s years, as this movement began to turn outward and make demands, bars were a central focus. And we saw battles between LGBT individuals and the police in these kind of public social spaces around the country. Here, a battle um, in San Francisco in 1966. Here, outside of a gay bar that had been raided in LA in 1967. And remember, gay bars were in every possible way illegal. It was illegal for homosexuals to gather. It was illegal for them to act in any homosexual way. And it, these bars were not allowed to serve liquor. They didn't have legal liquor licenses. Of course, the most significant of the battles over public space at a bar was the battle that occurred in New York in 1969, in the summer of 69, June, at the Stonewall Inn. You probably know the story of the Stonewall somewhat or fairly well. If you'd like to teach it, there's a great documentary that PBS has shown called The Stonewall Uprising that I recommend. Um, the Stonewall Inn was a gay bar in uh, the Great and Greenwich Village in New York, and it was illegal. Uh, it was run by the mafia. They were the only ones willing to run it, and they were running it not out of love for gay people, but for profit, which meant they served high-priced drinks that were typically watered down, um, they had no liquor license, of course, they couldn't get it. And so the bar was regularly raided by the police in efforts to shut it down. And June 28, 1969, the police raided the bar. Their focus was not on arresting all the patrons inside, but rather just the uh, bartenders, the managers, the bouncers, and anybody who was there in gender inappropriate clothing. So the bulk of the patrons were simply kicked out of the bar. But what was unusual that night in 1969 was that those patrons didn't simply go home. They hung around outside of the bar. And they watched as the police loaded the staff and those people in drag into um, their cars and paddy, paddy wagons. And tensions began to mount. The patrons were finally roused into violence by the arrest, it said, of a butch lesbian that night who called out to them essentially saying, what are you waiting for? There are more of you than them. What are you waiting for? And so anti-police rioting erupted that night outside of the bar and continued and was repeated for a few nights that week in the summer of 1969. These are some of the uh, rioters who gathered to take what would have counted as a kind of selfie back then. And if you'll notice, by contrast, we'd say those Mattachine um, folks protesting the bar rules at Julius's just a few years earlier, these are young people. Many of them were street kids. Many of them were trans, people of color. This was a new generation that was joining this rights movement, and they came to mark the vanguard of gay liberation. And gay liberation exploded as a phenomenon. While there had been a handful of homophile groups in the 1950s and 60s, there were hundreds of gay liberation groups that emerged. Groups like here, the GLS, the Gay Liberation Front, which saw itself as part of a wider American revolution, or groups like the Gay Activist Alliance that saw itself as a single issue civil rights group. Um, among all these groups, I want to stress three elements that gay liberation activist organizations had in common. The first of which is that in opposition to the secrecy of the homophile activists, gay liberation activists called for a personal politics of self-revelation. They said, tell everyone you are gay because that is how we will change the world. Come out, they insisted. In fact, that was the title of the GLF newspaper, Come Out. Be visible. No more secrecy. Secondly, as I've been stressing, they focused on public space. And indeed, both claiming public space 
to be acceptably used by gay men and women and also creating their own public spaces. This photo is of the first gay rights march in 1970 in New York City on the one year anniversary of those Stonewall riots. Uh, these marchers are heading up Sixth Avenue towards Central Park where they had what they called a gay inn. And you can see just by the, the, the number of people present there in Central Park, this event had the spirit of, of that kind of chant we hear, whose streets, our streets, right? Whose park, our park. We have a right to be here and be visible. In a similar way, the Gay Activist Alliance rented out a space down in New York, it is in, in Soho, and, and other organizations did this in other cities that became their headquarters. Um, they rented out what had once been a firehouse building, and so they called it the GAA Firehouse. They used it to have meetings, but also to have dances and movie nights, essentially saying, we don't need the mafia to create spaces for us. We can make our own spaces. And then the third element of gay liberation that I would underscore for you was how much they turned to direct political action. Gay liberation activists over the course of the 1970s fought successfully to have multiple cities, nearly 40, pass non-discrimination laws protecting the rights of gay and lesbian men and women. They argued successfully to have 22 states repeal their sodomy laws, their laws, their laws making gay sex illegal. They pushed into the expanding women's movement and got that movement to attend to and address the needs of lesbians. Even successfully got the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, to stop designating homosexuality as a mental illness. Through direct political action, the gay liberation movement was tremendously successful. And this combination of elements that led to their success is really clear, I think, in um, the career of one of the first openly gay, publicly elected officials in this country who was Harvey Milk. That's Milk on the right in the jacket and tie. Um, imagine you saw the Sean Penn film where he played Harvey Milk. I would just flag to you that that film was based on a terrific documentary called The Times of Harvey Milk that I've also taught many times in classes quite well. Um, in Milk's career, you can see not only his own commitment to coming out and encouraging other people to coming out, but how important the claiming of public space was. Because across the 1970s, we saw in major cities around the country, gay men and women, although much more gay men, claim public spaces in neighborhoods like the Castro in San Francisco, where they began to open open and operate gay-owned bars and restaurants and shops and indeed moved into the neighborhood, claimed it residentially. The Castro in San Francisco, like the village in New York or West Hollywood in LA, became a kind of ethnic enclave, though one of gays, though mostly men and mostly white. But it was out of that neighborhood and the, and the power, political power they were able to gain that they were able to elect Harvey Milk to office. And once in office, he was then able to drive through legislation protecting gay men and women in the city of San Francisco. So in Milk, we see kind of in a nutshell the power and success of gay liberation in the 1970s. Now, by the late 1970s, these advances that gay liberation achieved began to meet resistance, a backlash. Um, one that was increasingly harsh, both in political and social terms. That backlash appeared first, I think, most clearly in Miami, Florida, where Anita Bryant, a former Miss America contestant, actress, singer, um, led a campaign to repeal Miami's own laws, newly passed, protecting gay men and women from discrimination. She called her campaign the Save Our Children campaign identifying children as the likely victims of gay men and women. And she succeeded in having the voters of Miami repeal the newly passed laws protecting gay men and women. And so she brought that campaign to other cities in the country. 
in California, quite similarly, following uh, the example of Miami, a state senator put a proposition on the ballot to keep LGBT men and women from teaching in the public schools, again identifying children as the victims of a gay rights movement. The battle over Proposition 6 was hard fought in the state of California, and it brought Harvey Milk, you'll see him there, to larger prominence. It really also helped to bring this issue of gay rights and the resistance to it to national attention. Now, Proposition 6 in California was defeated, and so there was a brief moment of victory, a feeling of victory in California. But within weeks after that victory, Harvey Milk was assassinated in his office, and the movement that Anita Bryant started became a pillar in a much larger national movement, a movement that saw power in targeting gay men and women and pushing back against them. This was a movement that some refer to as the moral majority, but we more generally might identify as the rising power of a new Christian right, which of course had enormous an enormous impact on this country as a whole, and particularly once they had the ear in the 1980s of then-President Ronald Reagan. Whatever successes the gay rights movement had in the 1970s, the Christian right shaped the government response to, new, to a new and really more profound crisis that emerged in the 1980s in gay communities around the country. And that response that they helped shape was largely one of indifference on behalf of the government. That crisis, of course, was the arrival in 1981 of some kind of sickness. When gay men began to fall ill with diseases that nobody else seemed to be getting sick from and then dying from them. Nobody knew for several years what exactly was happening, but we now know this was the appearance of HIV AIDS in gay communities across the country. There's a powerful documentary I'll flag for you here called We Were Here that's very personal and quite moving um, about the impact of AIDS among a handful of folks in San Francisco. We know uh, that scientists quite recently have begun revising the history of this epidemic, but it's clear still that 1981 saw the appearance of visible illnesses, though, from an unknown cause. Those illnesses occurred in low numbers until about 1984, 85, 86, when an epidemic really exploded in gay communities around the country. This is my own very um, poor bar graph demonstrating the, sh the kind of shape and exponential growth of this epidemic. And you can see um, that in the early years of this epidemic, the deaths were in the hundreds. And it was quite imaginable to me that intensive government action in 82, 83, 84 might have really changed the shape of how this epidemic played out in this country. But because of the power of the Christian right, many of whom called AIDS God's revenge against homosexuals, Reagan, Ronald Reagan, and the Federal Department of Health really did very little about AIDS until five or six years into the epidemic, until 1987, by which time, as you can see, 20,000 Americans had already died. It's an outrageous figure and an incredible level of indifference from the government. During those years of the epidemic, of course, gay communities moved into action. They became their own social workers, their own healthcare experts, their own sex educators. Those were years when hospital staff often neglected people with AIDS, afraid to go into their rooms to bring them food or clean them when landlords might evict the partner of someone who died of AIDS because they didn't see the lease as something that was passed from one partner to another, and when Congress refused to fund any public education campaigns that described how to protect oneself during gay sex because they didn't want to be seen as advocating gay sex. When the federal government finally engaged in 87, it triggered such outrage among the gay community, but a new activist wave began, spearheaded by an organization called ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, 
there's much to be said about ACT UP, much more than I could say um, today. But fundamentally, ACT UP used the visual media, media, visual graphic, and again, direct action to challenge the way the federal government and pharmaceutical companies had been dealing with HIV. And their efforts over the next five or six years not only successfully garnered attention from the federal government, but really changed the course of research in terms of finding medication that today keeps HIV a chronic, not fatal illness. Regardless of the success of ACT UP, of which of course we have to celebrate, I'm always reminded about this chart and its shape and always thinking about the hundreds and thousands of, die, of, of individuals who died likely unnecessarily, dead as much from neglect as from this virus. Now, AIDS activism also had a kind of secondary impact in the country. Um, beyond simply getting attention to AIDS, AIDS activism also led, well, led for the first time for a presidential candidate, a different Clinton, yes, um, to begin to court gay voters, to begin to identify gay men and women as a political constituency. This had never happened before. And Clinton, as a candidate, also began to make promises to gay voters. Not promises that he fulfilled completely, but nonetheless promises, one of which was that he would direct more money to AIDS care and research, which he did do. Clinton, though, also promised that he would immediately, upon taking office, repeal the, the still existent military ban from preventing LGBT folk from serving in the military. That he did not actually do. Instead, in 1993, he established a new policy called Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which proved ultimately more harmful, saw an increased level of discharges um, over the subsequent uh, 15 years than had previously been the case. Clinton also disappointed LGBT Americans by signing into law something called DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. In the early 1990s, there were rumors coming out of Hawaii that Hawaii was about to allow gay marriage. And this is something we could talk about later, but it's clear that AIDS, in part, drove the interest of activists in marriage as a goal because of the protections that marriage brought the visitation rights, the, the um, post-death rights, a variety of rights that are built into marriage, um, the medical care rights, and made activists start to be interested in marriage. And so in the early 90s, there was this concern that Hawaii is about to allow gay marriage. And a number of states said, whoa, 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 if gay people get married in Hawaii, we don't want to be forced to recognize those marriages. And so legislation came up through the Congress and landed on Clinton's desk, which he signed, and it said that neither the states nor the federal government need to recognize same-sex marriages performed elsewhere. So in some surprising way, the 1990s felt like continued political setbacks for a movement which in the 1970s had been quite successful and for a movement which seemed to have a sympathetic ear in President Clinton. Internally, the 1990s also saw growing activism inside of the movement among trans individuals who began to really push the T in LGBT and began to really join forces with lesbian and gay activists in a newly felt way. Where there were gains in the 1990s, they largely came in the area of popular culture. Mainstream Hollywood, for the first time, finally had a film that portrayed people with AIDS and the person of Tom Hanks in this film, Philadelphia. A central character on a popular sitcom called The Ellen Show was allowed to be gay, played by Ellen DeGeneres, who came out both on the show and then in public. At the time, that really marked the end of that sitcom and stopped Ellen's career for many years. But nonetheless, it paved the way for a show that came out not long afterwards called Will and Grace, which was one of the most popular sitcoms for about 10 years, which featured two main characters, two men, uh, who were both gay. And this cultural trend, and I think we tend to downplay the importance of culture, this cultural trend continued across the beginning of the new century, certainly on TV, where 
on Glee, we saw two high school boys fall in love. More recently on Modern Family, two men um, not only have become a couple, but are dads together. And we've even seen this kind of takeoff um, hit in RuPaul's Drag Race. As I said, we tend to slight the significance of popular culture, but it seems fairly clear to me that popular culture did important work in this country in paving the way for dramatic political changes that have unfolded in these last dozen years. Popular culture set up what then has happened over the last decade and a half. Now, even if we look from a national perspective, we can see enormous strides that were made in this last decade. Um, first of all, in 2003, 2003, right, into the 21st century, the Supreme Court at last declared um, sodomy laws, laws against gay sex, unconstitutional. This was in the decision of Lawrence v. Texas. And I just want to share this, uh, this decision written by Justice Kennedy, who said, but although these laws, right, laws about sex, purport to do no, no more than prohibit a particular sexual act, their penalties and purposes have, far, have more far-reaching consequences, touching upon the most private human conduct, sexual behavior, and in the most private of places, the home. They seek to control a personal relationship that, whether or not it's entitled to formal recognition in the law, right, we're not going to say that yet, is still within the liberty of persons to choose without being punished as criminals. The liberty protected by the Constitution allows homosexual persons the right to choose to enter upon relationships in the confines of their homes and their own private lives and, and still retain their dignity as free persons. So here the Supreme Court finally declared the dignity of homosexual life of gay men and women. Once Obama became president, he then did fulfill Clinton, Bill Clinton's promise and successfully repealed that ban that had been in place for 70 years um, from World War II, from the 1940s. And as we know, he's also, or his administration has also been working out trans inclusion as well. In 2013, the Supreme Court overturned um, that law that Clinton had signed, DOMA, said that not recognizing marriages performed elsewhere violated um, the full faith and credit elements of the Constitution. And then last year, the Supreme Court finally actually declared that marriage equality was a right. It did grant legal recognition to the relationships that just a dozen years earlier they, the court seemed uncertain if they deserve protection. Here again from Ken Justice Kennedy, no union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love and fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were. As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would misunderstand these men and women to say they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law, and the Constitution grants them that right. I have to say that for me, and I don't know how old the rest of you are, but for me, these dozen years have been remarkable years to live through when it seemed like every few years some enormous step of progress in terms of the fight for the gay rights movement was unfolding. In fact, some people, and this is the uh, jacket cover from Linda Hirschman's book, some people declared that the gay rights movement last year essentially achieved victory. It had reached its goals. There certainly was some of that feeling, though many people have said, whoa, 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 marriage rights are hardly all the rights that LGBT folks need. This is a map um, from the uh, LGBTQ task force. It's a map that I think looks very familiar um, this week, um, which indicates all the places where queer folk maybe could get married but don't 
but could also get fired from their jobs, um, could be denied housing, could be denied services. Um, these are this map in many ways was a reminder that there's really still a lot of work to do. And certainly in that LGBT acronym, there's still few protections in place for trans folk around the country. I'm afraid that that sense that there's still much work to do only seems clearer with last week's election, um, which has brought our seniors on the verge rather of bringing into office a candidate who's waffled about his commitments to marriage equality, who's made clear that he's opposed to trans protections, and has also made clear that he believes that there are religious um, reasons, justifications for discrimination against LGBT people. So I feel like the talk that I would have given last fall is so different this year because it seems perhaps that the pendulum is swinging, that maybe a new backlash is unfolding. It's definitely clear that here in 2016 there is much work that we need to do and maybe that we will be redoing. It's in that context that I just want to reiterate what I said at the beginning, which is the importance of the efforts you are making to hold ground and to bring change to your schools and communities. And I believe that by being inclusive, by being upstanders, as I'm learning to say, you will make a difference in your students' lives. And, and I just want to add as a, as a final thought that you can jump into the conversations about gender and sexuality with students anywhere, not only if you treat the, or teach the history that I've just been discussing. There are so many places to begin to raise these issues and questions. You can talk about the changing history of marriage in this country with reference to this film that's out right now about the Loving v. Virginia case. You can raise questions about men alone together if you teach the history of the gold rush or maybe you teach the progressive era, and progressive reform driven by women who in deep bonds with other women ran the settlement house movement in this country. Maybe in your community it would make sense to talk about the NBA All-Star Game in February, which because of the anti-trans uh, legislation was moved out of Charlotte to New Orleans in February. Or maybe in your classroom you can track the progress of the case that Gavin Grimm will bring before the Supreme Court this year, the high school student, trans student, whose use of the bathroom in his, in his school is a subject of controversy. You can jump in anywhere. I really want you to know that, and I want you to know that wherever you jump in, you will have a significant impact, and I urge you to do it. Let me leave up this list of film documentaries for you. Oh, and let me just note at the bottom, um, both uh, this book, Gay America, which is written as a high school aged um, appropriate textbook to teach much of this history, and this collection of primary sources, We Are Everywhere, which has many of the documents that I've referred to and many, many others that can be great primary sources for teaching. Um, and then let me just leave now for us to take questions or have a kind of discussion from here. Professor Hurwitz, um, thank you so much. What an incredible and oftentimes painful journey. Um, we, have, we have some time left um, as planned for Q&A, so I'd like to um, open this session up to discussion. Again, uh, if you're listening and you'd like to ask a question, please type it in the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. I'll be selecting questions um, quite probably out of order uh, in order to keep the conversation um, flowing. Uh, I am hoping that we'll be able to get to everyone's question. Um, you know, we do have a limited, um, finite amount of time, so I apologize in advance if time doesn't permit us um, to, to get to everyone's question. Um, and while everyone's busy typing their questions, I'm going to invoke moderator's privilege and ask the first. My question is historical, going back to the 1950s and especially the early to mid 1960s, and and I was wondering um, about uh, the Mattachine Society or the, the, the and its chapters and the Daughters of Belitis, um how they felt about African American gay and lesbians, 
um, as well as was there any attempt at joining forces, for lack of a better term, um, with the African American civil rights movement? Because I know that um, oftentimes teachers um, focus primarily on the African American civil rights movement, but bring in other movements that were happening concurrently. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, sure. Um, it's an interesting um, and difficult question. I, I think it's certainly true when we look at the history of Mattachine that, well, even in the ways that I was trying to flag and looking at the um, pledge, that Mattachine was not as progressive in 1950, 51, 52 as we wish it were. Um, and the, in the mid-1950s, many of the early leftist and communist leaders of Mattachine, like Harry Hay, were actually kicked out of the organization as more conservative folks took the leadership. They feared how radical Madison had been. Hay, among others, was very interested, and in part because of his own background in the Communist Party, in um, racial equality and racial issues. Um, in Los Angeles, where the organization began, um, he and others um, made an effort to really um, try to join forces in solidarity with Mexican Americans in LA. Um, in the neighborhood where Hay lived, there was um, police violence against Mexican youths that felt very much like um, the kind of police harassment and entrapment that gay men experienced. And so the fact Hay pushed for Madison members um, to come to hearings about the police treatment of these Mexican kids in LA. Um, and I think in part that's simply because um, where, they, where they were based, um, that kind of Latino community was much more visible and present to them. Um, there were a couple of organizations that emerged specifically in, in the LA actually to try to be a kind of um, black and white together. I think they even had a kind of um, motto like that, to try to be a multiracial gay organization. Um, in terms of the success of either Madison or Daughters of Belitis in achieving that goal, I think their success was limited. Um, their success was limited. And there's been interesting work that's been done about different cities around the country that shows that in these years, even as gay bars were segregated from straight bars, they also became, in, by and large, segregated racially. So achieving a racially integrated gay community in social spaces, let alone in terms of politics, um, be became a, a, a difficult goal to achieve, although that had been a goal. Um, I, I would just add, um, and it's just a question makes me think about this play that I've been working on about bioaggression. I think we also know that queer folks were also participating not necessarily under a gay banner, but participating in other racial justice movements, social justice movements. And so um, I just would mention this figure whom I'm captivated by, Bayard Rustin, um, who had been in the 1940s a leading pacifist, nonviolent activist in the country, um, an African-American man who was also gay, and whose career as a pacifist was really shut down when he was arrested repeatedly for gay sex crimes you know, basically just having gay sex um, landed him in jail. But nonetheless, Rustin ultimately became Martin Luther King's kind of secret mentor um, and really trained him in um, how to lead a, a, non, a movement around nonviolence. Um, Rustin was often kept in the background and King often distanced himself from Rustin because of Rustin's gay um, reputation. But nonetheless, Rustin played a pivotal role in that March in Washington, 1963, that really positioned King as the national leader of that movement. That was all organized by Rustin. Um, so in many ways, um, almost sort of behind the curtain, this uh, the African American Civil Rights Movement was was um, peopled also by gay men and women who played central roles. Eaton asked a somewhat related question. I'm hoping you could address pretty quickly. Um, how tightly knit was the early lesbian movement to the early gay movement? I know you said the Daughters of Belitis kind of felt like they needed their own space, but 
once they had their own organization um, with, with their own chapters, did the two organizations still collaborate at all or connect at all or any way, or was it kind of two, two you know, arrows pointing in different ways? Um, and see you later. You know, I'd say across the 1950s and into the 60s, um, men and women inside of the homophile movement worked together. They often had joint conferences, joint meetings. Um, if you asked, and in retrospect, the homophile women about how they were treated in, in those meetings and in those collaborative efforts, they often felt like they were treated as second-class citizens, which is to say that those women sounded a lot like um, the women of the new left uh, uh, who's, who were asked to do secretarial tasks and make the coffee and do kind of organizing work while men stepped to the front. Um, that wasn't always the case. Um, someone like, there were many women like Barbara Giddings um, who became leaders in, in the larger homophile movement. But by 1970, as a broader national, more radicalized women's movement took hold, we saw many um, homophile women say, I've had enough. I'm turning my back on you men of the homophile movement because you're too sexist. Um, and that happened repeatedly inside of gay liberation organizations as well. That the, at a certain point, the lesbians kind of packed up and said, this is clearly an organization or a movement for gay men, and we're going to go do our own thing. Um, Todd asked a question that I was thinking about myself much earlier in your talk. Was the linkage of ending prohibition and establishing the bar rules just serendipity? Or was there some underlying connection? Or was this political opportunism by social conservatives at the time? Could you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, which is, so if I understand it, just, just to say, like, why is it that that's the moment where we see the segregation of gay men and women That's socially? how I understood is the question. Right? That's how I'm going to ask it. Um, I know you talked yeah. about um, prohibition, yeah. but it's was so there something else going on as well? It's a really interesting question. I mean, the history of speakeasies as um, kind of open wide spaces, spaces where people across classes, across genders and sexualities mingled is fascinating. Um, and as much as the shutting down of or the repeal of prohibition was about um, changing uh, liquor, it was also a reaction against this nightlife that had taken root in cities around the country. Um, and in the context of the Depression, what many historians have argued is that that nightlife seemed to be part of this kind of upside-down world that the Depression had brought, where men were losing their jobs and being fired, um, couldn't take care of their families, where women, it was imagined, had actually taken men's jobs, um, which is to say that part of the anxiety that the Depression brought was gender anxiety. Um, and so what's expressed in the repeal of prohibition is not just the legalization of the sale of liquor, but also a kind of pushing against this topsy-turvy gendered world. Um, and so across the 1930s, in a variety of ways, we see the inscribing of, of much stiffer gender norms again. And and beyond simply the exclusion of social spaces uh, for gay men and women, we also see in the 1930s, for instance, a movie code in Hollywood that um, not only governs the sexual behavior of, of men and women with each other, but also explicitly excluded the depiction of homosexuality on, on the screen. The same is true in Broadway, on the, in the theater. Um, in the 1930s, there was a, a padlock law that said any theater that allowed or that presented gay stories would um, lose its theatrical license. So um, one historian, George Chauncey, argues that what we saw across the 1930s was this kind of sweeping drive to push gay men and women from um, the popular culture, to exclude them and shut them out. So what's true of bars was true in this wider way. Um, so that in a way, um, by the 1940s, people had forgotten. People were no longer being reminded about the presence 
of queers in their lives and in their communities because they weren't seeing them when they went out drinking. They weren't seeing them when they went to the movies. They were being erased, as it were, um, from American culture. That actually leads um, directly to the next question. Um, so, so we have this closing, as it were, this this push pushing out, pushing away. Um, yeah. Was it the yeah. rise in visibility and occupation of public spaces that you talked about, the chief factor that explained the shift in um, in American society and ways of thinking about? Um, LGBT people that led to the change in some of these state laws that you were talking about? Um, or, I mean, was it, was it just the fact that more were coming out? Or was it something else going on, too? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. I really think that the strategy that gay liberationists took on was really successful, right? Coming out was a strategy of visibility. So the 1930s, at the um, government level, was a strategy of erasure that really succeeded, right, to, in driving steadily over the 30s, 40s, and 50s, driving gay people into hiding lives of the closet, right? That's what the closet was. It was about moving into hiding. And many historians argue that the closet didn't exist before the 1930s, that kind of secrecy and shame. Well, coming out was about flipping that strategy on its head and becoming visible. Um, but I think also historians rightly argue that, and I'm sure as many of you teach in your classrooms, we experienced what, what historians call a minority rights revolution in the 1960s and 70s, where a variety of minority groups came to the fore and said, much as the communists had been arguing since the 1930s, said we are part of the American social fabric and we demand our rights. Um, and so the visibility that coming out brought allowed gay liberation activists to join that chorus of groups demanding their rights and to really succeed. I mean, they were persistent and they were brave in terrific ways. They did sittings at magazines. They did sittings in government offices. They really did direct political action and activism. Um, but they also benefited from this rising tide but ultimately we would call identity politics, the success of identity politics benefited them to lead to, yes, these cities that, that established uh, non-discrimination laws or states that repealed sodomy laws. Liz asked a question about works of fiction. She's wondering if you have any recommendations for fictional works that portray LGBT characters in positive and or non-stereotypical ways. Of, is it of particular periods or general? I mean, it's interesting. Um, my son's school librarian has been feeding me a steady stream of YA fiction that's out right now and coming out um, that feature LGBT characters in terrific ways. Um, I'd be happy to gather up some of those names, and through Josh, I could I could send them some of those along. Yeah, that's um, certainly a, that's certainly a possibility. Also, a great. Yeah, and but um, I'm just thinking historically. Well, the first name that pops to mind, of course, is James Baldwin and books like Giovanni's Room, which is a much more painful but important historic document. Um, Leslie Feinberg's Doing Butch Blues. Um, I'd be happy to share more, but off the top of my head, those are the ones that are coming to mind. Thank you. Yeah, again, if um, if you would be willing to share, uh, you know, the, it doesn't have to be an exhaustive, sure. it's just, I think, a place to start. Um, when this, uh, you know, recording gets put up on our YouTube channel and is available for, for viewing, we'll be emailing everyone anyway, and I'd be happy to include um, some of those recommendations. Um, yeah, and, and I'd be interested to know if people were more interested in kind of contemporary fiction or... Uh, Liz clarified that she was interested in any period. Maybe we could say quality over quantity and whatever um, you think or anything that uh, your son's librarian um, thinks uh, has flagged to you as being like, oh, really, you know, you really got to read this one. Um, that's, that would be wonderful. Um, another question I wanted to uh, ask somebody actually asked here, 
is um, situating this in global perspective. Um, this, I just don't know if that's something you do know about. You know, oftentimes the primary source we take, particularly our um, American history or uh, American social issues, and <laughs> the organization is um, a lot about globalizing these things. And so I'm wondering if you, in your own teaching, if you ever refer to LGBT rights um, in other countries, that perhaps things are happening at the same time, or perhaps the United States is doing things very differently than other places. Could you talk uh, about that very briefly? Well, I, yeah, just quickly, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't claim to any expertise on this. I, I think the the narrative of the American 20th and into 21st century around LGBT rights, um, which is to say, um, a kind of early in the century period of integration and tolerance to some degree acceptance followed in the 1930s by rising intolerance and then in the latter decades of the century a kind of uh, liberation, a successful liberation movement. That um, back and forth swinging is a narrative that certainly in many European countries is similar. Um, the exact timing is not the same, but if we think about, you know, um, gosh, if you know Cabaret, if you think about Weimar Germany, many scholars would argue that New York City in the 1920s didn't feel so different in terms of the integration of gay life um, as, say, Berlin might have felt in those years. Although there was a much more, um, in Germany, there was a, already a really successful um, gay rights movement emerging in those years. Um, but we also know that Nazi Germany um, witnessed similar and ultimately much more egregious pushback against that world. Um, and we know that in, later on in the century as liberation came, well, for instance, in England we saw the uh, lifting of codes against homosexual behavior much earlier than we saw it here. We saw it later in the second half of the 20th century, but earlier than we saw it in the United States. Um, and interestingly, even I think in the sodomy case in Lawrence, you see Justice Kennedy saying, um, in 2003 that is, you see him saying, I think we're behind the times here compared to so many other developed countries. So in other places, the pendulum has swung more quickly towards liberation. Um, and also, I think that's true in terms of gay marriage. So it's a similar swinging pendulum if we look to Europe, but the timing is somewhat different. And I think it's very specific country by country. Thanks for that. We have just a few minutes. I do want to wrap up on time at 8.15. Um, and I have a few closing comments that um, I'd like to share. But um, before I get to those, um, in 30 seconds or so, what's your hope uh, moving forward, not not just for the incoming administration, but, but beyond that as well? Um, I have a friend who uh, runs that organization now, GLSEN, that I, that I mentioned their research from in 2009, and she recently posted, maybe some of you seen, have seen it, a map of what it, what this election might have looked like had only young people voted. Um, and I, I think my hope lies in those young people because particularly around these issues, because of the work of teachers like you all, their attitudes t around gender and sexuality are changing dramatically. Um, and I re remain optimistic about the power of those young people to keep um, moving it all forward or swinging the pendulum again. Um, I don't know what these next years or whatnot are, are going to entail, but I certainly think um, those young people, your students, um, their siblings are creating the foundation for a much different world than even we experienced 30 years ago. So, so with them and with your guidance of them, I'm optimistic. Well, thank you again so much. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to take just a moment to highlight um, 
one additional collection of resources on this subject, a uh, collection you might find helpful, uh, one that we here at Primary Source put together um, on social justice movements uh, more broadly. But this particular tab on this particular resource guide you see here um, has highlights uh, books and websites and articles and films, et cetera, for learning more and teaching more about uh, the LGBT movement and LGBT rights. I've copied and pasted the URL at the bottom of the screen for you, um, and I do encourage you to check it out. Um, and uh, yeah, one of those books is a book of oral histories. So it's really the, the making gay history is full of individual voices that students can really react to. And the, the Stonewall book is, is like a page turner of the Stonewall Uprising. Also yeah, I have to check them out myself. This is a new topic um, for me, uh, and I'm excited to do so. Um, I do want to wrap up, though, uh, make sure that um, people can get enough sleep to, to teach tomorrow. Professor Hurwitz, um, thank you so much again for taking the time to speak with us uh, today. It's been such a pleasure collaborating you um, to put together this webinar, and thanks also to everyone who joined us tonight, um, as Professor Erwitz was saying, uh, your willingness to teach more on this subject is inspiring, um, and I hope you found tonight's session helpful. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be up on our YouTube channel, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, probably in a few days. So if you have friends or colleagues who weren't able to join us live, um, please feel free to share. Um, you can also stay connected to all of our programs and, and curricula many of which are free, like this program, uh, through our website and your social media outlets, which you see here. Um, please check out everything that we have in store for you and let us know how we can help you uh, bring global learning and culturally responsive teaching to your classrooms. Thanks, everyone.